The Chronological Gospels, the life and 70-week ministry of the Messiah, presents an opportunity to read the Gospels and teachings of Yeshua in the order in which they transpired and in a fresh Hebraic context, returning life and passion to the words on the page. The Chronological Gospel solves many of the problems that stem from Western Gentile misunderstandings of the language, land, and culture of the ancient Hebrew Scriptures. This is the paradigm shift for which you have been waiting an entire lifetime. This is the greatest story never told. It's all about Yeshua, the prophet, the promised Messiah. Join me here in the land of Israel as we take a chronological and archeological journey through the Gospels. You have never seen anything like this before. I'm Michael Rood, prepare for a rude awakening. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke record the event of Yeshua's baptism through his temptation in the wilderness. Though none of them were at his baptism, in the wilderness with him, nor with him when he was tempted, they do give an accurate record from the two firsthand witnesses to these events, Yeshua and Yohanan. Yohanan ben Zechariah, John the Baptist, reported that he witnessed the revelation-confirming moment that the Holy Spirit, in the form of a dove, descended upon Yeshua. Then he heard a voice from heaven proclaiming, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. When Yeshua came up out of the water, he was immediately driven into the wilderness where he fasted for the next 40 days and 40 nights. After his 40-day fast, on the 41st day, Satan came to tempt Yeshua. After the record of the temptation, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are dead silent for the next two months until Yeshua returned to Jerusalem for the Feast of Shavuot, Pentecost, and discovered that his cousin, the prophet Yohanan, had been imprisoned by Herod. Only the Gospel of John reports the events that transpired on the banks of the Jordan River when Yohanan was being questioned by the priests and Levites who were sent by the Pharisee-controlled Sanhedrin. It was the 41st day of Yeshua's ministry that both the temptation of Yeshua and Yohanan's inquisition took place. This was the day before Yeshua came out of the wilderness. It was upon Yeshua's return from the wilderness that Yohanan proclaimed, behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. It is the Gospel of John that covers the day-to-day -day events of Yeshua's ministry from the day he comes out of the wilderness until he leaves Jerusalem after the Feast of Shavuot. I know that this sequence is contrary to every Hollywood movie that you have seen, but it is the only version that is true to the screenplay written by holy men of God who were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, let's get into the details because the kingdom of heaven is in the details. To minimize confusion, in this episode, I will use the name John when referring to the gospel author and Yohanan when referring to the one called John the Baptist in the West, even though they were both named Yohanan. This is a testimony of Yohanan, John the Baptist, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask. The term the Jews is used a total of 64 times in the King James Version of the Gospel of John, and it invariably refers to the Pharisee leaders. These priests and Levites were sent by the Pharisees to document the testimony of Yohanan. This was the equivalent of a legal deposition today. They are questioning him to determine whether there is sufficient evidence to consider charges of heresy against Yohanan, who is undermining the nation's religious systems. And this is Yohanan's testimony. Yeshua refers to this testimony several times during impassioned altercations with the Pharisees. Again, this is the testimony of Yohanan. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask, who are you? Without hesitation, Yohanan confessed, 
I am not the Messiah. Who are you then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Again, they asked, are you the prophet? He answered, no. When they asked Yohanan whether he was the prophet, they were referring to the revelation recorded by Moses in Deuteronomy 18 concerning the prophet we must shema, the prophet we must hear and obey. The prophecies were not clear as to whether the prophet and the Messiah were one and the same person or two individuals. Then they were covering all possibilities when they cited the prophet Malachi, who stated that Elijah must come before the day of Yehovah. Then they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say of yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of Yehovah, as said by the prophet Isaiah. Verse 24, now the Kohanim and Levites from Jerusalem were sent by the Pharisees. The Pharisees controlled the Sanhedrin, the rabbinic high court that claims that it is solely their responsibility to authenticate and anoint the Messiah as the King of Israel. The Gospel of John is unique in that it uses the term the Jews when referring to the Pharisee religious leaders. The term the Jews is always used in a negative context because of Yeshua's constant conflict with the invented rules and regulations of the Pharisees. It must be remembered, however, that all those who were following Yeshua were Jews, that those who were being healed were Jews, and that Yeshua himself was a Jew. To the uninformed Gentile reader, the term the Jews in John's Gospel provokes an anti-Jewish sentiment, whereas in context, it is understood to show the separation between those who followed Moses and kept the commandments and those who followed a religious system of their own invention by utilizing some of the teachings of Moses, but adding to and taking away from the written Torah at their own convenience. Today, invented rules and negation of God's commandments are much more prevalent in today's version of churchianity than they were among the Pharisees of Yeshua's day. Then they asked, if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet, why do you mikvah out there in the wilderness? Yohanan answered, I mikvah with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. Though he comes after me, he is preferred before me. Even a sandal latchet, I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Beit Abarah, beyond the Jordan, where Yohanan was immersing. Yohanan's testimony to the priest and Levites concludes with the location at which the testimony was recorded, Beit Abarah. The next day, when Yeshua returned from his 40-day fast and his subsequent temptation, Yohanan was still immersing at Beit Abarah, the bait or house of the Abarah, which means to cross over, from whence we get the English word Hebrew. Abraham was the first Hebrew when he crossed over the Euphrates River on his way to the Promised Land. He left Babylon in the paganism of his father's house behind in search of the one true God. Abraham was the first one to search for the Hebrew roots of the faith. It is time to wake up and engage in the work of the ministry. We are on the edge of the age of redemption. Beit Abara was the great ford of the Jordan that still bears the name Machadet Abara, the ford of the crossing over. It is about 25 miles east of Nazareth, just south of where the Jordan exits the Sea of Galilee. In ancient Israel, it was a fortified military installation with a barracks for troops. Today, it is a DMZ, a demilitarized zone between Israel and Jordan, replete with minefields and electrified concertina wire. Nothing much has changed from the time of the judges. Beit Abara is the Ma'abara that Jephthah and the Gileadite warriors occupied after his war with the Ammonites. 
Jephthah and his troops killed 42,000 cowardly Ephraimites who refused to go into the battle with them, but stayed in the comfort of their own communities while the survival of their nation was hanging in the balance. It was at this ford at the Jordan that Jephthah quizzed the spineless Ephraimites by asking them to say the word shibolet. When they could not properly enunciate the sh, the shin sound, as in Yeshua, but could only say Sibolet, as in Yeshua, their language exposed them as the Ephraimite deserters, and the Gileadite warriors killed them when they attempted to cross over the Jordan at Beit Abarah. It is a good idea to practice the sh sound before one tries to cross over into the promised land. Practice saying Yeshua, Yeshua. Yeshua. Beit Abraham was not only the place where Yeshua was immersed, it is also the place where he crossed over the Jordan 42 days later, the day after his temptation by Hasatan. He could not be a day late with his appointment with destiny. John 1, 29, the next day, the next day is the 42nd day of Yeshua's ministry. This is the day after Yeshua overcame his temptation in the wilderness after his 40-day fast. This is also the day after Yohanan gave his witness to the priests and Levites who were sent by the Pharisees. But every Hollywood movie places this incident at the time Jesus comes to John to be baptized. It destroys the chronology of the gospel records that our forefathers died to protect and to get into our hands. Let's continue. The next day, Yohanan saw Yeshua coming out of the wilderness toward him and cried out, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. On the prophetic calendar, this is one of the most important days in history. Hundreds of years earlier, while we were still in Babylon, the angel Gabriel instructed the prophet Daniel that there would be 77s determined upon God's people and the holy city of Jerusalem. These 77s, or 70 weeks, as it was translated into King James English, was divided up into sections. 77s, 77s, 62 sevens, after 62 sevens, one seven and in the midst of seven. The portion of Daniel's prophecy that we need to focus our attention is found in the 25th verse of Daniel chapter nine. From the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven sevens and 62 sevens or a total of 69 sevens. The scribe Ezra recorded the very day that Israel crossed over the Euphrates River by commandment of Artaxerxes on their way back to restore and build Jerusalem. It was the first day of the first month in the seventh year of the reign of Artaxerxes, 457 before the Common Era. That was the moment Daniel's prophetic timeline commenced. Exactly 483 years, or 69 sevens of years after the commandment of Artaxerxes to go forth and build Jerusalem, brings us to the first day of the first month in the year 27 of the Common Era. That was the day that Yeshua crossed over the Jordan River and Yohanan announced to the world, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. This monumental event occurred at Beit Abara, the house of crossing over. This was biblical Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year on the Creator's calendar, the first day of the first month of 27 of the Common Era. It was in the midst of Yeshua's 29th year. He was not yet 30 years of age as Luke reported. This is amazing. The prophecy that the angel Gabriel gave to Daniel was fulfilled to the very day at the end of 483 years. The first segments of Daniel's prophecy have come to pass with precision that could only be guided by the master of the universe. 
but there remains the 70th seven to fulfill, which will commence at the confirmation of the covenant when the Ark of the Covenant is revealed at the zenith of Zechariah's thermonuclear war. The return of King Yeshua to rule the earth with the rod of iron is still several years away. It is time to wake up and engage in the work of the ministry. We are on the edge of the age of redemption. Yeshua was anointed by the Heavenly Father with something much more significant than olive oil. He was anointed with the Holy Spirit. At the time that Yohanan proclaimed Yeshua to be the Lamb of God, he also gave his testimony concerning what he saw at the time Yeshua was baptized, 42 days earlier. Take notice that John was not recording Yeshua's baptism as it was happening. John was documenting Yohanan's testimony about that event. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know his identity, but I came to mikvah with water so that he could be openly declared to Israel. Then Yohanan bear record, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove entered a boat upon him. And though I did not know him, the Almighty who sent me to mikvah with water said to me, upon whom you shall see the spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which will mikvah with the Holy Spirit. And I, Yohanan, saw this happen and I bear record that this is the son of Yahovah. Again, the next day, this is now day 43. It is Sunday, March 30th, 27 of the Common Era, and Yohanan was standing with two of his disciples. When he saw Yeshua approaching, he again proclaimed, Behold the Lamb of Yahovah. Yohanan heard the voice from heaven proclaim Yeshua as his beloved son, yet he prophetically announced him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Just as the ram in the thicket was a substitute for Abraham's son Isaac, so the male lamb of the first year was a substitute for the nation of Israel at the time of Passover. Both substitutionary sacrifices foreshadowed the Son of God as the provision for all mankind. Yohanan's proclamation was made on the first day of the month of the Aviv Barley, the first day of the new year, which would soon initiate the acceptable year of the Lord, which began on Shavuot of that year. Though many defenders of Eusebius have attempted to recharacterize Yeshua as a three-year-old red heifer so that they can imaginatively maintain Eusebius's three-and-a-half-year ministry fabrication, we have yet to discover a single biblical text that reads, Behold the cow of God who takes away the sin of the world. Neither have we found a Hebrew text of Isaiah that proclaims the acceptable three and a half years of the Lord. In fact, there has never been a three-year-old red heifer in the history of Israel. The Talmud and Mishnah gives an exhaustive description of the qualifications of the red heifer, whose entire carcass, including her dung, was to be incinerated in the ashes added to the waters of purification. Any qualifying red heifer, less than two years old to even more than five years of age, was deemed valid by the sages. The Hebrew scriptures are completely silent on the age of the red heifer. The doctrine of Jesus, the three and a half year old red female cow, is utter nonsense. The day after Yohanan first proclaimed Yeshua as the Lamb of Yehovah, he gave a second witness directly to two of his disciples, Andrew, and as we find out later in the gospel, the other disciple is John. The two disciples heard him and immediately followed after Yeshua. When Yeshua saw them following, he turned to them and asked, what do you want? They said to him, Rabbi, where do you dwell? The salutation rabbi literally means great one. It was a title of respect invented by and reserved for the Pharisees, but it would have been safe for Yohanan's disciples to use it for the one who takes away the sin of the entire world. 
though Yeshua fervently forbade his disciples from adopting this Pharisaic title of nobility, he did not rebuke them for referring to him as rabbi. He clarified to his disciples that they were all brothers on the same level and that he was the only great one. A disciple of Yeshua would never assume a title of grandeur that he forbade his followers from embracing or take unto oneself a title that the king of kings claims for himself. Yeshua is the only great one. The rest of us are unworthy to unloose the sandals of the one who was unworthy to unloose Yeshua's sandal. Rabbi, where do you dwell? Yeshua said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day, for it was about the 10th hour. One of the two disciples of Yohanan who followed after Yeshua was Andrew, Shimon's brother. The first thing he did was to locate his brother Shimon. We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. The Greek text added a parenthetical phrase defining the word Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. The Hebrew word Mashiach technically means anointed with oil by the high priest which was done to every king of Israel. Mashiach was transliterated into Greek as Messias twice in the Gospel of John, but every other time it was adapted into Greek as Christos, which is derived from Christus, which means to smear with grease, a common practice for preserving Grecian leather battle shields. We really don't need to translate Mashiach when referring to Yeshua. Though every king of Israel was anointed as a Messiah, Yeshua was anointed by the heavenly Father with something much more significant than olive oil. He was anointed with the Holy Spirit. He is not only the prophet we must hear and obey, he is the Messiah who will rule the earth for a thousand years from his throne in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. 